Good morning. We are so glad that each of you have found your way here and made this part of your holiday weekend. We have so many in our church family who are traveling this weekend, including Dr. J and his family. So for those of you I haven't met yet, my name is Cindy Bright, and I am uh, pleased to be with you this morning as well. We have a big treat today because Reverend Gary Chapman is here. Um, he is going to be bringing us a message and presiding over communion for us. And Gary was our former district superintendent. He retired after 39, almost 39 years of active ministry. And for those of you who have been paying attention, you know that United Methodist Ministers don't actually get to retire. So uh, we, we are so pleased that he's here to share his gifts with us this morning um, instead of in his normal pew where he worships with us. Um, also glad that each of you are here. We want you to know that our youth mission team was here at 8 o'clock. We commissioned them and sent them on their way. So we ask for you to join us in praying for them in their big week. They've already had a lot of excitement before they even left town. So we hope that that's the uh, worst of it and the rest of their week is blessed. I want to mention a couple of announcements to you. One is if you have any need to be um, for the church office, the first part of this week, please read the announcement in your bulletin related to that, as many people are traveling and will be closed on the 4th. I also want to mention the survey. For those of you who are interested in participating in the survey for our feasibility study, most of you have probably received a link online to that survey, but we understand a lot of people are having trouble getting that link to work. So for those of you who don't have internet or are having trouble with that link and would like to complete a survey, there are paper copies in the church office. If you complete that today, you can return it to either Lee or myself. And if you want to take it with you, we just ask that you have it back here by Wednesday morning so it could be included in our totals and the consideration for our plans going forward. All right, the only other thing I have to mention that I'm aware of are the Get Connected cards in the pew in front of you. If you are a guest with us today, we invite you to complete one of those. Let us know that you were here, and let us know if there are other ways that we might reach out to you and share with you about the ministries of this fine church. And the back of that is a prayer request card as well, so we welcome any prayer requests that you would like us to lift up and have the church praying for. Please fill one of those out and put it in the offering plate as it comes around later in the service. Please hear now this prelude as we prepare our hearts and our minds for worship.
invite you to stand as we go to our Lord with our call to worship this morning. You may find that in your red hymnal on page 780. We will going, be going to the Lord with Psalm 146. Again, page 780 in your red hymnal. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble with its tumult. God is in the midst of the city which shall not be moved. God will help it at the dawn of the day. The Lord of hosts is with us. And as we remain standing, I invite you to join in singing number 622, There is a Fountain Filled with Blood.
remain standing as you're able. We'll share in this liturgy of communion. Lord Jesus Christ, you are the way of peace. Come into the brokenness of our lives and our land with your healing love. Help us to be willing to bow before you in true repentance and to bow to one another in real forgiveness. By the fire of your Holy Spirit, melt our hard hearts and consume the pride and prejudice which separate us. Fill us, O Lord, with your perfect love, which casts out our fear, and bind us together in that unity which you share with the Father and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated, and let's confess our sins, seated and in reverent prayer. Let's pray together. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Here are these promises of God. God's forgiveness is as everlasting as the ages. God's mercy is as wide as the seas. Surely God will forgive our sins and restore a right spirit within us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. We, as God's grateful people, always have an opportunity, some that we recognize and some that we don't, where that we can use our time and our talents and our gifts to return to God some of our blessings. I have a couple of ways that you can uh, use your time and talents this week to recommend to you. One, since this is Communion Sunday, any offering you leave on the altar rail as you come for communion this morning will go to support the ministries at the foundry in particular, their summer enrichment camps. Uh, five weeks this summer, they have 50 kids each week who come, and they learn all kinds of things about the Bible, about science, about gardening, all kinds of things that are helping these children stay up with their peers so that when they begin school in the fall, they will not have fallen behind in the summer months. And this is just one of the wonderful ministries at the Foundry. So any donations that you leave here on the altar rail, we will gladly pass on to them to support their ministries. I also want to point your attention to these baskets on either side of the altar rail. You will see baskets with little slips of paper in them. Each piece of paper has the name of someone who is on our youth mission trip. As I mentioned earlier, they left just this morning. They'll be gone all week to return Saturday. So if you feel so inclined to use your time to pray for one of these people on this trip, we would invite you to pick up a slip of paper and pray specifically for the person whose name that you draw and remember them each day this week. So at this time, I would like to invite our ushers to come forward to receive God's tithes and our offerings. <laughs>
Our scripture lesson this morning comes from Exodus. We will be beginning with Exodus 1, verse 8, and continuing through chapter 2, verse 10. You may find that in your pew Bible on page 500, or not 500, but 55. I encourage you to turn there and follow along now. And again, I will be beginning with Exodus 1, 8. Now a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. He said to his people, Look, the Israelite people are more numerous and more powerful than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, or they will increase, and in the event of war, join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore, they set taskmasters over them to oppress them with forced labor. They built supply cities for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread, so that the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites. The Egyptians became ruthless in imposing tasks on the Israelites and made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and in every kind of field labor. They were ruthless in all the tasks that they imposed on them. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shifra and the other Pua, when you act as midwives to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a boy, kill him but if it is a girl, she shall live. But the midwives le feared God, and they did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but they let the boys live. So the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this and allowed the boys to live? The midwives said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. So God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and became very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, Every boy that is born to the Hebrews you shall throw into the Nile, but you shall let every girl live. Now a man from the house of Levi went and married a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was a fine baby, she hid him for three months. When she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and plastered it with bitumen and pitch. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds on the bank of the river. The sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. The daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river while her attendants walked alongside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her maid to bring it. When she opened it, she saw this child. She was crying, and she took pity on him. This must be one of the Hebrew children, she said. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and get you a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Yes. So the girl went and called the child's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child and nurse it for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed it. When the child grew up, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and she took him as her son. She named him Moses because, she said, I drew him out of the water. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. May the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ be with you all. And also with you. It is a privilege and a joy to be back in the pulpit of what is now my home church. Um, it was right to say that uh, United Methodist ministers never retire. We go into retired status. We're under Episcopal, uh, not under Episcopal appointment anymore, but we have all the same accountabilities that we did before we retired. And one of those ways of being accountable is through membership and, uh, and reporting from time to time and through a local church. Uh, I have chosen this church as uh, my local church, and uh, apparently you have let me, so I am thankful for that. And it's so wonderful to be here today to help out my good friends Jay and Marion and Jericho while they have a little family time on their vacations, and good to see all of you here today. Will you bow your heads as we pray? 
And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, when that Levite woman conceived and bore her son, she took one look at that baby and delivered the same verdict using the very same word that God used seven times when God created the heavens and the earth. You remember what God said? You know the Hebrew word, don't you? The word is tov. T-O-V-E is the way we'd spell it. Say it with me. Tov. A simple word, but it looms large in the Bible. It's the Hebrew word meaning good. A baby Hebrew boy was born in Egypt, and his mother proclaimed that he was as good as God's own creation. Tov, she said of her new son, because he was a fine, fine baby. And when he was too big for her to hide any longer from Pharaoh's power, she made an ark for him. Now don't you argue with me on this. In the Moses story, English translations usually call it a basket, but I promise you it's the very same word God used with Noah that is translated ark. In fact, if you have one of those humongous volumes of Strong's exhaustive concordance of the Bible at your house, of course everybody goes online now, but I'm an old guy and I still have one of those. It's a fantastic doorstop, by the way, even for a very heavy door. But if you look in Strong's exhaustive concordance of the scriptures and you look under the word ark, there are two entries, and this is word for word from the book. Don't trust a preacher, trust the book. Vessel which Noah built, basket vessel in which Moses was placed. The word is ark with Noah and with Moses. She coated it with pitch just the way God instructed, to know, instructed Noah to do with his big basket boat and placed her little baby in the ark among the reeds, sometimes called bulrushes, of that river. And while the baby waited in his floating bassinet, his big sister watched to see who would find her little brother and possibly save him from a sure death in Pharaoh's hands. Now, I'll grant you it was risky. It could have been anyone who found the baby, a soldier, a fisherman, a kid skipping rocks. But odds were good that it would be a woman, since it was women who washed the clothes in those days, unlike now, and and women who fetched the water for the household for cooking and cleaning. However, the woman who found this baby, strangely enough, surprisingly enough, was not there to work at all. She was a princess. She had other women do her work for her, including the work of fetching and bringing her the basket she saw lodged in the reeds at the river's edge. And when that princess opened the basket, she saw a baby boy, and she took pity on him, not only because he was crying, because upon closer examination, she saw that he was circumcised. This must be one of the Hebrews' children, she said, knowing full well that her own father, the Pharaoh, had ordered all such children put to death in the same river she had just fetched this baby from. Ah, but she was a disobedient daughter. Never known one of those, have you? Maybe she just had her father's nature, and she was as self-governed as he was. Either way, she did not ask anyone's permission to keep the baby. And when a Hebrew girl suddenly appeared, that's the baby's sister who'd been watching from a distance all along, when she suddenly appeared and offered to find a wet nurse for the river baby, the princess did not ask, stop for a minute to ask permission or even to think. She simply said by royal decree, yes. And that was that. The baby, despite the fact it was a Hebrew male, was saved. And the baby's own mother, get this, the baby's own mother, who would have done the job anyway because she loved him, she was paid to help raise her own baby. 
And the Hebrews gained a future Savior whose life story already reflected everything essential to their own life story. A tov creation, an ark to keep their heads above the water, and to preview a little hint of the reeds that God would one day part to allow for their escape from Egypt. Now astonishingly, did you catch it? God is absent from this narrative. Or maybe I should say God is never named, but then again, neither is anyone else, save the baby. Moshe is the baby's name, or as we like to say it, Moses. You heard it in the reading, it literally means to draw out, as in the sense of drawing out of water. But figuratively, it came also to mean to save or to preserve, maybe in this case to save from drowning. Moses is both saved by an Egyptian and a future savior of his people from the Egyptians. Now by my count, that makes six players in this drama, though you may be thinking five, since only five are people. Let's see, we have the baby, the mother, the sister, the maid, and the princess. But over th almost 39 years, I think Cindy said it was, of reading the Bible and, in, and then some in childhood, I've come to think that any time you see the word water in Scripture, it has a very heavy meaning. And I've been reading Scripture lately through the lens of water and how important it is throughout the Bible. I've begun thinking of the river itself as the sixth character in this story. In the Moses story, water is more than merely a prop. The water causes me to remember, for instance, how the deep was with God before God spoke creation into being. How a river comes from Eden. How Jesus himself was baptized in the river. And how at the end, in a vision of heaven, a river runs through it. Water, water's DNA carries the beginning of everything that God created in it from the beginning of the story to the end. So I would ask today, what happens if we make the river a major character in the Moses story playing a major role? The Nile along with the Tigris-Euphrates in Iraq, the Indus in Pakistan, the Yellow River in China, is one of the four great rivers that cradles humankind. These large flooding rivers not only gave people fresh waters to drink and grow their crops, they were also highways of the ancient world, giving people the means of transportation to trade what they produced. Whoever controlled the river, you might say, controlled life. Small wonder then that kings and pharaohs of these early civilization were seen as kin to the gods. For as long as the waters flowed, their power was secure. Now in Egypt, the prototypical hydraulic empire, the pharaoh was triply blessed. In the first place, the annual flooding of the Nile was so predictable, so regular, that three seasons of the year were named for it. Inundation season, growing season, and harvest season. 120 days each, usually, don't forget that usually, but often regular as clockwork. In the second place, the Nile was navigable both ways with a current that ran north and a surface wind that moved south year round. And in the third place, the steep grade of the river kept water moving at a steady pace, flushing salts and other impurities from the irrigation system that less efficient rivers could simply not handle. Of course, the downside to these three blessings was that they meant Pharaoh needed a huge underclass of laborers 
both to build the massive waterworks and to maintain them. The first recorded dam in the world was a 49 feet high stone wall built in 2900 before the Christian era, built to protect Pharaoh's capital in Memphis, Egypt. But while Pharaoh needed such peasants to build and maintain these monuments, he also had to keep an eye on them. Because if those slaves began to have too many babies, then their numbers could swell to the point that they were a political threat and they could drink up the very resource they were there to serve and protect. In Egypt, the Pharaoh's main job was to control the flow of the Nile because the life of the people flowed from that river. Too much water and the crops washed away, too little water and everything green turned brown. And oh, how a Pharaoh hated years like that when the water didn't act the way it was supposed to. And yet, what could a Pharaoh do? Even a Pharaoh or a king can't control how much rain fell a thousand miles south in Ethiopia and Burundi, where the headwaters of the Nile lay. Now, I'm going to test you today, and I'm going to read a verse from Scripture. And I want you to be thinking about this verse and say, have I ever heard that before? Where have I heard that before? I'll narrow it down just this much. It, it's out of the Old Testament and not the New, but here are the words. Has the rain a father? Or who has begotten the dew? From whose womb did the ice come forth? And who has given birth to the hoarfrost of heaven? Anyone know the book? I heard it. It's from the book of Job. That's God questioning Job in a very sarcastic and mocking manner. It's a very poetic way of saying, Job, who 